I think the key thing, we are really at a tipping point. Uh, Congress has got to act. They can't keep putting this, pushing this can down the road. Welcome to Off the Chart with Medical Economics, a podcast featuring lively and informative conversations with healthcare experts, opinion leaders, and practicing physicians about the challenges facing doctors and medical practices. I'm your host, Keith Reynolds, and today we feature an interview between Medical Economics Editor Richard Payurchin and Dr. Stephen P. Furr, President of the American Academy of Family Physicians. They're discussing cuts in the Medicare fee schedule, the AAFP's work on increasing the number of physicians in rural areas, and even a bit about Furr's own family medicine practice in Alabama. I'm Richard Payerchin, reporting for Medical Economics. With me today is Dr. Stephen P. Furr, President of the American Academy of Family Physicians. He works as a family physician in Jackson, Alabama. Dr. Furr, thank you for joining us today. I'm glad to be with you. Since the last time we spoke, the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule for 2025 was published, and it forecasts a 2.8% cut for physician reimbursement next year. Can you discuss what effect that will have on your practice and on practices around the country? Yeah, I wish I could say we were surprised by this, but we were not. This is the fifth year in a row that Medicare has cut our rates. Uh, They've gone back and and taken some of that back, but a 2.8% rate cut is just totally untenable for our practices. When you realize, when you look at the Medicare economic index, we should be getting like a 3.6% raise, and then you take a 2.8% cut. And you've got to realize you had all the other cuts from the previous years on top of that. We've not had a, a real rate increase in terms of inflation over 21 years. So it really makes it where practices are unsustainable. And you might wonder why your, your physician might have sold their practice or joined another big medical group or hospital is because they can't afford to practice anymore. Um, and the real concern that we have with this is, you know, are physicians going to say, I no longer can afford to see Medicare patients? Uh, because it pays so poorly. Has AAFP made any efforts to inform Congress about the effects of the physician cut? We are up in Congress beating our heads uh, every, every time you can turn around. And we've been we've been beating this drum for a number of years, as has the AMA and other medical associations, because this affects all physicians, but it particularly affects family physicians in, in particular, because many of our physicians serve in rural and underserved areas where we do have a higher proportion of, of Medicare patients. And we don't have as many uh, private insurers to make up the difference in the cost. You know, we are excited about the fact that CMS has seen that they need to reward primary care. And they've added the G2211 code, which does increase our reimbursement some. But when you look at that reimbursement, but then take the 2.8% cut, it still puts us in the hole overall and even more in the hole when you consider inflation. Can you discuss the importance of the G2211 code for family physicians? Yeah, the one thing that we're really excited about this time is we've asked them, one of the problems with the G2211 code, when it first came out last year, starting in January of 2024, you couldn't use it when you actually charged also a modifier 25. So anytime we saw a patient for an annual wellness visit or they got a vaccination, we couldn't use the G2211 code because it had a modifier 25. So instead of using that code on many of our visits, we probably could only use them on 25 or 30 percent. So the fact that this time with a new recommendation that the G2211 code can be used when the modifier 25 is used with an annual wellness visit or with the administration of vaccine will actually increase the number of visits we'll actually be able to use that code. So we are really excited about that. And I think you touched on this a moment ago as well. Regarding the Medicare Economic Index, do you think Congress should base physician reimbursement on the Medicare Economic Index or another factor? That's, that's the minimum that we need at this stage. When you look at the previous cuts, and not only do you have the yearly cuts we've had, you remember Congress went through sequestration over a decade ago. So that's another 2% cut we had in addition to that. So these are these ongoing cuts that we've had that are really making medical practice unsustainable. But the minimum that we need is one, stop the cuts, and then get Medicare economic index in there. And you've got to realize everybody but physicians get that Medicare economic index. Hospitals get it. Nursing homes get it. Hospices get it. So we're the only medical group that does not get that. I think that's another good segue because it was this was a topic that has come up and, and has been in discussion. But 
not exactly related to Medicare reimbursement or the Medicare physician fee schedule that we're talking about right now, but could you talk a little bit about what effects would site neutral payment have for family physicians? Well, we think that's one of the things that is actually driving physicians to sell their practice or actually be bought up. We think that that should be a neutral arrangement that you shouldn't be able to be paid more, but just because of where you where you practice or the, the site that you're at. So we have long ag- advocated for site neutral payments that would meet that a level playing field. And we hope that will actually help prop up the private practice of medicine. And doctor, another great segue, you had mentioned a moment ago about, you know, physicians uh, selling their practices to join in, you know, with hospitals or health systems. Federal regulators have begun to take a stronger look at consolidation in healthcare. And does AAFP have a position on that? Have you commented on that for like the Federal Trade Commission or Congress? Certainly, you know, uh, we are. The biggest thing we're concerned about is uh, the fact that physicians need to be at a practice and that there shouldn't be a restricted trade. We're really concerned about the fact that physicians might sign a contract and because they might be part of your large health system, if they decide after a year or two they wanted to leave, or they would actually have to leave the state and definitely leave the county to be able to see their patients. So we're very concerned about that. For us, it's all about the patient-physician relationship. So we want the physicians to be able to be seen, the patients to be able to be seen by their physician no matter where they might practice. Again, that's a, another great segue because we have written a lot about the use of non-compete clauses or non-compete agreements in healthcare. And I know that there are arguments and, and reasonable arguments on both sides of, of that issue. Can you talk a little bit about non-compete agreements and non-compete clauses and what those mean for family practices? Of course, this will be probably tied up for legislation for years. So, But what we have done is we've made sure that we've made our members aware of that to be very careful when they sign their contracts to look in those issues of the non-competes and see how restrictive it might be and to look at is there a way they can negotiate portions of that, that it might not be so strenuous. So I think the important thing that we have done is raise the awareness of that for our members, realize that that is a big issue that they need to look very closely at when they do sign those contracts. To switch gears a little bit, if I may, um, this was an issue that I had seen on the website, actually, for the Academy. And, of course, it made national news earlier this year when Change Healthcare became the victim of a massive cyber attack. And certainly they didn't ask to be a victim, but that had wide ranging effects across healthcare. How are most practices recovering from the change healthcare cyber attack from earlier this year? Yeah, I think it's another problem that you see with the consolidation of medicine and and the problem with the consolidation of our whole economy with with the meltdown in the airlines and and the others over the last week. You can see when you've only got a few companies controlling almost everything, and there's a problem with them, whether it's a data breach or just a program that goes wrong, that it's hard to, hard to function with that. So I think all of our physicians have become more aware of how they need to protect their information and put up uh, uh, firewalls and other things to protect their information. So uh, it doesn't matter how big or how small you are. I mean, our small local hospital, 32 bed, got broken into by another cyber attack. So as time moves on, they're going to keep moving down the food chain. So you're never too big, you're never too small, anybody can be affected. So, and it does with all these things that have gone up, it makes it important that you do have redundant systems that you're able to back up your systems, but you're able to get online and do other things. So uh, there's nobody too big or too small to fail with this. Doctor, you make a great point. And this one is frankly, just me being curious about your perspective, but as a, in your own practice, are you like the the sole proprietor or are you in partnership with other physicians? Yeah, I have, I'm fortunate to have two of the family physicians and we actually have three nurse practitioners that work uh, together with us. We work closely with our rural hospital, but we are, we have our own EHR. So just like when the hospital EHR went down, when they had a cyber attack, ours was a totally separate system. So we were able to continue to function without any problem. So again, there's some things that are really good when everybody's on the same system, uh, but when it does go bad, it, it affects everybody. So then essentially nobody can function, nobody can access charts. So that's one of the downsides. Being a small business, then do you contract out your cybersecurity and your, your computer programming? Uh, yeah, we do. We, we have, That's part of what we have with our electronic medical record as far as doing that, yes. But the AFP actually, actually has a, uh, a strong insurance plan along with that. 
and you can actually do it through your malpractice carrier too. And also the AFP has an insurance, part of our insurance thing, we do have cybersecurity insurance. But along with that, we do have all the things that are built in with our EHR. Excellent. One of the biggest, but of course, the, the biggest thing with that is just educating your employees, you know, being careful and not going on other websites or be careful what they link. And we've actually had to restrict it that we've blocked certain things where employees can't get on a limit how much they can do because it only takes one to make a mistake to bring down the whole system. You know what? And maybe this is, I'll switch gears again slightly here. This may be a little bit more on the clinical side. AAFP this year published a practice manual addressing health disparities for patients with obesity. Because obesity is a growing health concern, what should primary care physicians know as they prescribe more and more available treatments? I think the great thing is, is we have more available and more treatments to use than we've ever had. Sometimes they're difficult for our patients to afford, but really knowing what's available and what's out there. So our patients are just making them aware of the complications of obesity and how we can manage those. The great thing about some of the drugs that we're, we're treating with obesity with, we're seeing the rate of cardiovascular disease goes down, the rate of sleep apnea goes down. So not only are we treating just their obesity, we're treating the other underlying medical problems that go along with that. So it's a great time to be able to treat obesity. Uh, but the thing I've, I've found is that we still got to work with our patients to do all the things that they normally should do to eat right, to exercise, and do all the basics. Uh, sometimes they get so focused on the medicines, they think the medicines can do all the work, but they've still got to do all those basics that are so important to live a healthy lifestyle. Doctor, in recent days, there's been a lot of public discussion um, by lawmakers and federal regulators regarding pharmacy benefit managers. And I didn't know if the Academy had taken a stance on pharmaceutical pricing and management in our country. Is that something you want to talk about? Yeah, we're just concerned about the price of pharmaceuticals in general because we know it's a health equity issue that many of our patients cannot afford drugs that cost a thousand dollars a month. Many of our Medicare patients uh, quickly go in the donut hole at mid-year and then can't afford any of their medicines. So the pricing is definitely a concern. We were excited, but when insulin was limited, how much you would have to pay for insulin along with that. So it is a huge issue. I mean, some people can afford the medicines, but a large number of our patients cannot. You got to re remember even Medicare patients, a number of them, there's millions of them that still don't have uh, prescription drug coverage. They don't have uh, Part D. So that is a really a huge issue. This summer, the Academy announced support for new physician residencies in rural communities. What is the status of that plan and why is that so important? Well, the importance of that is what we find is, is as you often know, wherever somebody does their residency, that's often where they tend to practice or stay in that area. So by having training in community centers and in small in smaller rural areas, our hope is they'll tend to practice and stay in those areas because that's where our, most of our needs really are. We need family physicians everywhere, but that's where they can really make a big difference. So the importance of those, uh, that training, those teaching health centers is to make sure that Congress adequately funds those. The problem they've often in the past been funded on a year to year basis, and we need to have long term funding for that so that they can be stable. You know, doctor, we've covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time here, and I really appreciate the roundup here. What did I not ask about that you would like other physicians to know? I think you've really done a good job of covering everything, but I, I think the key thing, we are really at a tipping point. Uh, Congress has got to act. They can't keep putting this, pushing this can down the road. Uh, as you see, there's a consolidation in healthcare, physician practices. Many of them are going out of practice or just choosing to go ahead and retire. retire. And we've got to get the Medicare reimbursement schedule. Something has to be done to it, whether it's getting inflationary update, uh, where it is uh, increasing the payment that goes out, but it's not sustainable in the form that it is. And I'm worried not only for our physicians, and that's for all physicians, but I'm also worried about our patients, that they're not going to be able to get care uh, if, if the Medicare physician fee schedule is not an adequate reimbursement for our people coming out. And you've got to realize that students and residents coming out are now coming out with a mountain of debt. So unfortunately, as payment goes down, they're going, they're going to tend to choose just those higher paying specialties to try and make up that difference. I'll tell you what, doctor, <laughs> there's never not things to talk about in healthcare, and I could pick your brain probably the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> um, I'll let you get back to work. I really do appreciate okay. the roundup here. Again, that was medical economics editor Richard Payerchin and Dr. Stephen P. Furr, president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. 
My name is Keith Reynolds, and on behalf of the whole medical economics team, I'd like to thank you for listening and ask that you please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Also, if you'd like to get a digest of the best stories medical economics publishes delivered straight to your email six days a week, subscribe to our newsletter at medicaleconomics.com.